I'm just going to do what God wants me to do here this morning. And what he wants me to read to you here this morning about, about these little things in our lives that we don't see anything, we don't see a problem with. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you pay mint. You pay tithe of mint and eyes of cunning. He said, you do certain things. He said, you wear your phylacteries, your broad phylacteries. He said, you wear your priestly garments. He said, you you keep the house of God neat and clean. He said, you you do this and you do that and you keep the ordinances of God and you do all the outward things that you can see. But he said, you're going to need to weigh your matters of law, judgment, and mercy. He said, these you ought to have done and not to leave the other undone. Listen, I know that there's a standard we need to live by and convictions that we have. The way we dress, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we talk out here in public, the way we uh, present ourselves to other people. I know that. There's, I know you have to do that. But the most important thing is showing the mercy and the, right, and the righteous judgment to other people that you want to be shown to your own self. That's the thing we ought to concentrate on more than we do anything else. Listen to these other things. When I got saved, these outward things in my life, the outward sins and the things, that, they were easy to overcome because the Lord and the faith that he gave me to overcome them, those things were not hard. The way I dressed, the, the things that I did as far as letting God lead and guide me, the place that I worked, done this, and when I heard David preach it and I read the word and God convicted me, I, I moved my life to it. I moved my life to this and that and everything, the convictions that God put upon me, those were the easy things. Those were kindergarten stuff. And I know some of us still ain't out of kindergarten. And I'm not trying to de de degrade you. I'm not trying to put you down. But if you cannot overcome the outward sins in your life that you know is hindering you, I'm talking about the addictions. I'm talking about all these other things. Then you will never, ever, ever work on what's the most important thing. Is your character and your personality. You'll never work yeah. on that. Until you get these other things out of your life, you'll never work on that because those are the most important. And I realize and understand, you can wear your hair dragging the ground. You can wear dresses dragging the ground. Men can wear clothes that's not provocative. They can, uh, they can do all kinds of different things and not have the heart and not have the mercy upon people. And God would rather you have mercy than to do that, than to sacrifice. But he said, these you ought to have done and not to leave the other undone. The most important thing in your life is you. It's getting you out of the way. That's what God's working on more than he is anything else in your life. And that's what he's trying to do. But remember something. When you got saved, you wasn't perfect. You, you may have got rid of the sins you know in your life, but you was not a perfect individual. It's only when you begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of God and you look at things through the eyes of God and through the Word then you realize the things you were coming short of. When I look at how God loves me and how He takes care of me and what He does as far as dealing with me, I fall so short of that same thing with my own children. I try my very best with my kids to pray for them and try to lead them, try to help them, and try to guide them, even the ones that's up under my roof, even the ones that's above 18. I still try to help them if they, I mean, if I can. And I still pray for them. But listen to me, though. This is what I'm trying to tell you. I can't do that if there's things in my life that's hindering my prayer life to God. So what I'm going to try, to, I'm going to go to is in 1 Kings, and start right here, and I'm going to read some things right here. In 1 Kings, this is Solomon. He was a wise man. He was the richest man at that time, but he's the wisest man ever lived other than Jesus Christ. I want to go to verse 2. 1 Kings 3, 2. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built in the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his David, his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this day and we thank you, Lord, for all that you do. But God, help us realize one thing. We have to bring an offering in a place, God, where you require it. God, not anywhere we want to, but God, where you require it. 
and how you require it. Lord, the broken, contrite spirit. God, you won't accept anything else and anything less. But Lord, we just ask you, God, to speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, lead us and guide us through this message this morning. And help us, Lord, I pray, to receive this word and apply it to our lives. God, I thank you for what you've already shown me through it as I study this out. God, I can't help these people, Lord, if I'm living contrary to what I'm trying to preach. Help me, Lord, I pray, to live according to this word. It's in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You'll find something right here in this in this word. The high places. It was wrong for people to sacrifice in high places or under trees. That would be in the open. God's altar could be under trees or under under you know groves. It couldn't. They could be. It couldn't be that way. Turn your Bible to Second Kings fourteen. Second Kings fourteen. In the second year of Joash, son of Joah. Joaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Yet not like David his father, he did according to all things that Joash his father did. Howbeit, the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burn incense on the high places. Turn your Bibles over here, if you will, now to chapter 15, verse 1. In the 20 and 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. 16 years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned 2 and 50 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. Now turn your Bible over here, if you will, to chapter 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, the Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty-nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David, his father, did. Listen, he done went back to David. See, all the rest of these didn't. But now Hezekiah went back and done it. All that his father David had done. Listen, he had fathers before David, but he went back. We need to go back and seek the old path. Amen. The right way. The exact way. Not partial way, but the exact way. But look at what he did. He removed the high places. You, you listen to that right there, Hezekiah, he removed the high places. This man put his foot down, and he went back to where David was, not Solomon, not any of the kings before him, but Hezekiah went back to David. And he removed all of the high places and all the images and the groves and come down. But look what he did to him, though. But look what God did to Hezekiah. And cut down the groves of breaking pieces of brass and serpent Moses made for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Neshethan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. You listen to that? For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered with us wherever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. Hezekiah went all out. Are you all in? You ever heard the old, you all in? I'm all in. Hezekiah was all in. He said, God, I'm giving it all. I'm going back to the old path. I'm going back to where it was when King David was reigning. Not when Solomon reigned. Not when this. Listen to me. Solomon Never got rid of the high places. Yeah, he's the wisest man to ever live, and God blessed him so immensely. He said, Solomon, what shall I give you? And he said, I need wisdom, God, to, to judge these people, because Solomon was only a teenager when he became king. He said, I don't have the wisdom to judge these people, God. He said, I want wisdom to be able to judge these people right. And it pleased God what Solomon said, even though he still had the high places. And even though he burnt a thousand burnt offerings in the highest place he could go to. And you said, well, why did God not listen to me? When I first got saved, there was, there was things in my life that God knew wasn't right. 
He knew they wasn't right. But God was going to do that in his time. And when I began to get, when I got saved, I began to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. God began to reveal these things in my life, the high places, the growth, the images, all the things that I used to worship. And he began to work upon me and try and wanted to get all these things out of my life, just like he does yours. Amen. Because you know what's going to happen? If you leave those in your life, somewhere you're not, you, when, as a young Christian, you're going to grow, and you're going to have to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. And somewhere, if you don't get those out, those personality flaws, those character flaws, those deep ingrained things in your life that you don't see that they're a sin to you. Listen to me. I have things in my life that's a greater sin than the outward things that I do. They are. There's times in my life that I've sinned a more grievous sin than I would if I come in here wearing a pair of shorts. Because you see, there's some things, listen to me, I have conviction of that, but I'm telling you this. There's things that I do at times that's a greater sin than that. Just like he told the Pharisees, he said, you pay tithe of men and I have coming. He said, but you'll meet the waiter matters of law. Judgment, mercy, he said, he's ought to have done not leave the other undone. Listen, there's things in my life that I need out. Because there's things that hinder me just like this Solomon. How many of you in here know the end of Solomon? Any of you in here know what happened to Solomon in the end of his life? The Bible said God was angry with him. And Solomon clave to all these women in love, and God told him. He said, Solomon, he said, don't marry these women of these strange nations. He said, they're going to turn your heart away from me. Somewhere, Solomon, they're going to turn you away from me when, you're older, when you get older. When you get older as a Christian, these little things that's in your life right now that you think ain't no big deal, you think you do this and do that, and God's still blessing, you're still going on. You're thinking, but now listen to me, God reminds you of things. He said, this is not right. And you're going on. You still have strength. You still have the ability. But somewhere, that little fox is going to spoil the grapes. Amen. Somewhere, that little bitty sin, that little bit of leaving that you put in there is going to leave in the whole lump. And it's going to get you, it's going to get God angry at you. And God's going to have to bring chastisement upon you. Because of that little thing that you know, do. Listen to me. Listen to me and hate and grouchy ain't no, uh, it's not a, a quality. Having a short temper is not a quality. It ain't something to brag about. Those are sins. True. Those are things that's to be easily beset. It's turn your Bible over here, if you will, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Turn your Bible, book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we're encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Every one of us in here has weights and sins that even beset us. And you say, well, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. Most of them, some of us in here may not acknowledge them yet, but we got them. They even beset us. And like I was taught in Sunday school a while ago, where's the joy? Where's the blessings of God that's pouring out on your life? Now listen to me. If you're being blessed of God, you'll see that in people's lives. Not by what they say out of their mouth, but what you see in their life. You see them grow. You see them become the Christian that God wanted them to be. That's where you see the blessings in your in people's lives. Not so much about the shouting and, the, and the, all the different things, but the growth that you see and how the people overcome themselves. That's where you see the blessings in your. How many of you in here would give anything in the world if you was if you could have the same mind, the same faith, the same ability that Jesus Christ had? Amen. How many of you in here would like to have that? Everybody in here, you're a Christian. You would give anything in the world if you had enough. Your personality, your character was like Jesus Christ. But you know what? It ain't. That's why you've got to work toward that. That's why you've got to see it. If you don't see your personality, you don't see the flaws in you, if you don't see these weights and these sins that easily beset you, then you'll never work toward them and you'll never conquer them. But they're there. What hindered, listen, you can see the sin in your life that easily besets you, and you struggle with more than you do anything else. If you ask God and say, God, why is that there, and how do I overcome that? He'll show you. If you recognize that it's a problem, and you recognize it's sin in your life, and you recognize it's a weight that holds you down, every time you want to do something for God, it just weights you down. It might be covetousness. It might be every time you want to do something for God, you get your mind distracted on worldly things. Whatever it is, you look at it, you recognize it, Satan, the enemy is right there. Solomon, 
and all these other kings, Jehoshaphat had a flaw in his character. He liked making friendship with people, and he did not look at their spiritual condition. All he looked at was the natural part of them, and he never looked at their spiritual condition. And it was a downfall. And it cost him in the end because that's, that's his last act. But you know why? He was a good king. He'd done all the things. He walked. Listen, he sent teachers throughout Israel to teach them the word of God. He loved the Lord and walked in all the ways. But one, there was one thing that Jehoshaphat always, even to the very end of his life, he made friendships and things with people that did not love God. That was unspiritual people that hindered him. And God at one time was going to kill him for it. When he come back to Mayhem, Ahab, a wicked man. And Jehoshaphat went to battle with that guy. And he took all his people and went to battle with him. And you know the story. And they was going to kill Jehoshaphat, but God was with him. And they killed Ahab that day so that God's prophecy would be fulfilled. But when Jehoshaphat was coming back to Israel, when, or I mean when he was coming back to Jerusalem, because see, he was the king of Judah. Ahab was the king of Israel. That got divided. The kingdom got divided when, when Solomon, when Solomon during his reign, God divided the kingdom of Israel into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. So he was with the king of Israel as a wicked man. And when he was coming back, a seer met him by the road and said, O king, he said, why do you love them that hate God? He said, the wrath of God's upon you. And he said, nevertheless, he said, there's good things found in thee. So he didn't kill him, but he warned him. But you know what? He warned him, but he still never got that out of his spirit. He never got that out of his personality because it got to him at the end of it. And that's, and that's the only act you've seen of, of, of uh, Jehoshaphat is all the ships that he built and then God destroyed them all and then he slept with his fathers. That was his last act. His last act was act of rebellion. Just was. I'm just telling you right now but he's a good king. He done things what's right in the eyes of God. And you better realize don't take because you're serving the Lord and everything's going good in your life and you're still doing this and you're still doing that. Don't take that as God has forgotten about these things in your life that's besetting you. Amen. Don't forget and, real, and forget or somewhere, if you put them aside, listen to me, Solomon, that's no big deal, man. I got, you know, he had wisdom above everybody on the earth. Solomon, had, God talked to him, spoke to him, and gave him wisdom above every man upon the earth. They, the Queen of Sheba came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And she brought all kinds of gifts of, of, of gold and silver and myrrh and all kinds of precious ointments and apes and peacocks and all these things. And she brought all this and brought it to Solomon. Because you know why? Because God said, you never ask for riches? He said, I'm going to give it to you. And he put it upon the heart of all these people in these countries to bring Solomon gold and silver and brass and, and, and tin and met all kinds of precious gems and all kinds of things. And he was the richest man that ever lived in the world at that time. Because God said he would. But you know what he also told him? He said that he never promised him long life. You know why God didn't promise Solomon long life? Because he knew the deep flaws in Solomon's character. Where did he get them from? Dad. He got them from Dad. Yeah. Listen, David had 300 wives and concubines. Now why a man needs 300 wives and concubines? I have no idea. But I'm going to tell you this. Solomon had a thousand. And you said, well, David was pretty, listen to me, Solomon had a thousand. You see, Solomon did not have control like his father David. Listen, in the end, David had control. He had Abishag, a young Shunammite girl. Probably no doubt she was probably a young teenager. And David never touched her in any inappropriate way. But she laid in his bosom to keep him warm because he was an old man and, and he could not get no heat. How many of you in here know what that's like? You cover up, you put all these covers on you and you still can't get warm. And so, certain people can't because they're on certain blood thinners and different things like that. You freeze so easy. Well, David was that way. But he never touched that young shoe my girl. Abishai, you know what? But Solomon never had control. Solomon could not control those things. And he began to marry every woman he thought was pretty, every woman that was of a different nationality and he thought was just different, he would marry her. 
And the Bible said he claimed to him in love. Did he love him? I doubt it. He probably lusted after most of them, but this is what I'm trying to tell you, though. Look where it got Solomon at. But you know where it started? The high places. That little sin that Solomon never thought much about. Those little things that some of the other kings never thought much about the hospital at. They never thought much about this. You know why? Because you're in that culture. You're in a culture where you don't think much about certain things that goes on in the church. Because it's been on and on so long, you don't see nothing wrong with it. There's nothing, there's nobody sees anything wrong anymore with certain things in the church. And you say, well, there was a preacher one time, got rebuked. He went to a church and he preached to them people, but he named some of the sins, you know, that he was preaching on. And that pastor took him aside after he got through preaching. And he said, brother, he said, you know, I don't care. He said, you come in here and you preach on sin. He said, you know, because we got it. You know, in the church, you know, there's people and guilty and different things. He said, you preach on sin, but he said, you don't need to be naming it. And he looked at that preacher. He looked at that pastor. He said, well, pastor, he said, how are people going to know what they're doing wrong if you don't tell them? How are they going to know that this is a sin if you don't tell them it's a sin? If you just say don't sin, then nobody does. There ain't nobody sinning. Now, I ain't got nothing in my life. You listen to me right now. When you get down to nitty gritty, Oh, yeah, well, people know that's who I am. You know, listen, I'm telling you. You don't need to be, you don't have people to cater to your weakness. You need to overcome your weakness. Really? Instead of people cater to your weakness. You say, well, that's just who they are. You know, you just got to kind of kick over them on eggshells because you don't want to hurt their feelings. No, they need to put their feelings on their sleeve. It's just the way it is. I'm telling you, every time you say something, you get mad. Listen, you don't need to wear your feelings on your sleeve. People don't need to tiptoe around you, walk on the eggshells because they're afraid to say something that's going to hurt your feelings. Listen, if you're like that and you've been in church 20 or 30 years, you need to grow up. Amen. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm just telling you you need to grow up. You need to get out of kindergarten. You need to start working on the flaws in your character and realize one thing. Hey, I'm the problem. Quit blaming everybody else around you for the things you're going through. Listen to me. Going down verse 2, he said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despite his shame, to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary to paint your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scores at every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastity, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. We all have to be chastened of God and rebuked of God because we do things we shouldn't do. Listen, and, and most of it is in our personality. He said you shouldn't have said that. I mean, if you say things you should not have said. Listen to me, you know how you control your tongue? Control you. You'll control your tongue if you can control you. And if you can get your mind centered upon the things of God, and you can control you. You know how you can love your wife or husband better? Control you. Control yourself. Don't always think about you and what you want to do. Listen to me, women are different than men. How many of you in here have men? Really? They, well, they have to be. I'd hate for women to be like men. How many of you in here want a woman like God that can, that can whip? I told the boys at first one time, I said, well... I said, I said one thing, I'm not marrying one that can whip me. I don't want to marry some woman that she sits here and walks around like this and she's got biceps bigger than my leg. But you know what? Because women need to be feminine. Men need to be men. But now it's flipped around. Women are masculine and men are wimps. I'm just telling you because we won't take her place in the house. Because the women, listen, they don't have big biceps, but I'm going to tell you one thing right now. The Bible says for a man to be head of the house, not the wife, she don't have to, she don't have to get you in a headlock and, and make you cry uncle. The only thing she has to do is say, well, you sleep on the couch. You know why? Because men are different than women. You tell a guy that, and you know what? He gets, you get his attention. But I'll tell you this, though. You better control yourself. You men better control yourself because you don't mind. Yeah. Because if you don't, now Satan knows what to get you with, and he knows how to hammer you down. And, you, and, and the wife's a wicker vessel. I'm just telling you, you know what you need to do? 
you need to pray and get God on the scene. He said, God, what do I need to do? And he said, well, he said, you go tell her this and you get her this. I said, I don't want to do that. She said, I'm going to win. And you know what? But you do the things that God's asking you to do. And you know what I'm going to tell you? And your wife respects you. You've got to earn respect from people. You know what? You can't treat your wife like you want to be treated because she's different than you are. She wants to be hugged. She wants to be told she's loved. She wants to have flowers at times. Listen to me, men are not like that. I'm just telling you one thing right now. They're just not most of them. you got to understand and realize one thing. You have personality flaws that you've got to understand and realize you've got. You don't love people like you should love them. And you say, well, yeah, I do. I love this, love that. You know why? Because it's too hard for us to get to a place of admit that we're like that. It's hard for us to admit that we don't love our kids like we ought to love them. We don't love our wife or our husbands like we ought to love them. It's hard for us to admit that. Why? Because it's just hard. You know what? It's, it's just as hard to talk about that as it is, you know, in parts of marriage and things like that. You know, people get embarrassed when you start mentioning certain things. I know. And it's just like telling people you love them. You're like, I love you. You don't want to tell the guys in the, in, in, in the parking lot out there hearing you say that. And there's some guys that don't care, but you know what? How many of you heard people get off the phone and say, and after they sat there and cussed each other out for five minutes, you say, man. And then all of a sudden he says, bye, I love you. And then hangs the phone up. Do you believe him in? I doubt it. He wouldn't just sit there and cuss her out for five minutes if he meant what he said. Listen to me, you can't tell people you love them and then treat them like dirt. Listen, you, people know you love them by the way you treat them, not by what you say. I can tell everybody in here I love you. And then next time I see you in the ditch down there somewhere, I'd just be like a leaf. I'd turn my head the other way. And I'd say, well, I didn't see you. I would have thought and helped you, but I promise you, I didn't see you. You know I'm a brother, and you know I care about you. If I see you stranded or I see you in need and try to help you. Not that I tell you that every service. Amen. Listen, I'm just telling you. But he said, but he said in the word of God, he said, but if you be without chastisement, you're where of all the patriots and bastards and not sons. You're going to get whipped by God. Amen. Somewhere you're going to get rebuked by God. He may not take a limb to you, but you're going to get rebuked by him. And there's times that God rebukes through the pulpit. And listen, I've been rebuked. But you better realize this. And I know from where I'm coming from, and that's why I'm trying to. The Bible also, Paul told Timothy, he said, Timothy, he said, be, he said, be meek, be gentle. He said, if God permits you give them offense and knowledge of the truth, he said, you preach the word, but he said, you'd be meek and gentle. If God needs to give you boldness, he'll give it to you. I don't have no problems being bold. But I have a very hard time being meek and gentle. I don't have any problems with just saying certain things, just saying what's on my mind or whatever, but I have a hard time showing the love for people that I ought to. I have a hard time doing that. I do have a hard time doing that. You said, well, you shouldn't have a hard time telling your wife, your children, you love them. Well, I tell them that, but not as often as I ought to. Why? Because there's a problem there. You better realize there's a problem there. But you know what? Ah, you know, guys, you know, they don't love them. This is my dad. Like, this is my dad's words one time. He got saved, and he knows that. And we got to talk about this one time, and he heard me preach a sermon. And he was home, it bothered me. I got home, and he's crying. He said, Tom, he said, you know, I know I didn't tell you. He said, I always thought you knew I did. I said, well, Dad, I said, you know, there's times, though, that we have to tell people. But you see, he thought, he said, I thought you always knew I loved you. Well, there's times you got to tell them you do. There's times you got to tell them you love them. Because if you don't, how are they ever going to know? Because you want me to tell you something right now? And listen, I, I, I'm not bringing up old, old things. But you, you people in here with your kids, I use this as an example. And Dad wouldn't care if we use it now. I was 13 years old, 12, probably 12, I guess. I was just as age where you'd have to carry a gun. <laughs> you, you could carry a gun. You'd go hunting. I was 12 years old. Dad never took me. He said, you be careful. And he said, you keep that barrel pointed away from it. Listen to me, I never took no hunter education courses. I got grandfathered into it. Hey, man, I'm not... I'm not some guy that puts a cap on a muffler and pulls the trigger on my boot and blows two of my toes off. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, but listen to me. 
But I'm telling you, I almost killed myself with those because I didn't handle guns right, but you know what? Dad never took me home. He gave me a 20 gauge shotgun and a pocket full of shells at 12 years old and said, there it is. And I'm like, well, where do I go? <laughs> Ralph said, I'll put on a uh, grassy knob be a good place, so that's where I went. And we went hunting, I went by myself. Me and my Uncle Jesse went. First time I ever went hunting. Yeah, he was with me, I'm sorry. But you know what? Dad didn't get me home. He said, well, you just stay in the woods on the lake your whole life. Yeah, I know. He'd go camping, but he never took me hunting. Because he just went camping and drank. He went to the lake to drink. <laughs> hey, man, I put more chicken liver on a chalk line than you put in this room. You know why? Because Dad sat back in the back of the boat, and he'd do this and that, and we'd do all the work and do everything else in the world. And you know what it was? It was work to us, and it wasn't no fun. It wasn't no fun to us. And you know what? I just like my boys, there's some things ain't no fun to them, so what's the point? I'm not going to waste my time going somewhere and doing something for them if they, ain't going to, if they ain't going to enjoy that. But you know what? You've got to spend time with people, and then they know you love them. My boys want me to spend every 24-7 with them. I can't do that. But I try my best to do the things I can do with them and listen. Because somewhere, them boys are going to pass it on. And I'm doing it. And I'm, and I'm setting by example. I'm setting by example. You said, why are you setting by example? Because I'm not teaching my children about love like I ought to and how you ought to love how you ought to love people. You say you're not? No, I ain't. I'm falling short when I look at the word of God. And I'm not doing you know how I, you know how I know? It's because of the way God treats me. He said, You do that? I said, No, that's God. You see, because I sat here on this pulpit this morning and I and I and I was just reminiscing about things and I was crying because of what God has done to me in the past. And he said, You ever run your kids that way? Very few times. I'm not setting a good example. Turn your Bibles over here, if you will, in the Word of God. He said in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 30, the wonderful, horrible things to be in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rope with their means, my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? You know what he's talking about? Prophets prophesy, and the priests bear rope with their means. They preach to you and teach to you what's all right with them. They teach you and preach to you things that's not right because they have a problem with it and they can't tell you. And so you know what they do? They pass it on down the line. And then you have people just like, just like me as a, a dad. I can pass right on down the line the things that my dad taught me and my mom taught me. Not tell my kids and do this and do that and raise them up and, and, not, and the, not the way they ought to and just pass it right on down the line. I see women that, that has overbearing personalities and they pass it on to their children and their daughters. You know what they do? They try to run a home. They try to be the boss and they try to do this and it causes them problems when they get married and when it gets on down the road. And you know what happens? Then they have children and then they pass it right on to their children. And then those women right there, they begin to do the same thing. They begin to want to be the boss in the family too. And then the men, they raise up people like I was before I got saved. You know what? Wouldn't take responsibility in my family. Made my wife get out and help me work and make and pay the bills and do everything else in the world. Listen, do what you want to do. But what I'm telling you is this, that's my responsibility. And you know what I did? And I and I just wasn't, wasn't responsible. All I want to do is hunt and fish. I didn't care about anything else really much. I had a wife, you know, and I just, whatever. But that's all I wanted to do. I had no responsibilities, and I made her help me. But when I was lost out in sin, when I got saved, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. God began to work on those, those flaws in my personality and my character. Listen, some of those outward things I moved to readily, some of them I didn't. I took responsibility in my home. I began to work, and my wife came home. And we started, and, and that's just things that was pretty easy for me to do. But then the love part came in. The more weightier matters of all, I had a harder time with. I had a hard time showing it. You know why? Because my dad did. The only thing I saw in my dad was just fighting and fussing all the time. He never said good things to my mom. He never did say anything good to my mom most of the time. He just fighting and fussing all the time. So you know what? He kind of related over to me. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something right now. And, and a lot of times I do the same thing because I'm, I, I'm, I'm a man's man. 
because I don't cry. Before I got saved, I never cried. No matter what happened. You get hurt, break your arm, break your leg, I gotta get up and go on. But do this, do this. Listen to me, you don't cry. You know why? Because you, you know why? Because the guys inside him start laughing at you. How many of you see some of those YouTube videos, them guys on them skateboards and they're running down there and they jump up on them things, they fall and break half the bones in their bodies and land there and agony and everything. The guys are over and say, man, are you hurting? What do you think? You know, you get so mad, but he said, man, he's crying, he's crying. And a bone sticking out of his leg. But you know what? Macho. I'm going to tell you this. You can hold on to your machoism. Don't tell your wife and your kids you love them like you ought to. And, and just keep doing that. But you know what you're doing? You know what you're doing? You're teaching your kids to do the same thing. And you don't have a good... Listen to me. Me and my wife... Some of you up, some of you in this church think, man, you and your wife have the rockiest marriage I've ever seen. We may have. And we've been through some rough times. We've been married 31 years. But you know what? Most of us because of me. Because I didn't row the boat like I ought to and I didn't tow the line like I should. I wasn't the man of the house to be in in a lot of ways. I didn't teach my wife and my children how they ought to love one another. I didn't do that like I should. Why? Well, they didn't have natural affection. They didn't have natural love in my heart. Because I never was taught. You have to learn. You say, well, I don't believe you learn to love somebody. I believe you love them or you don't. Listen to me. You have a certain love for people. When I was lost, I had a certain love for my wife and kids. But I did not know the love that God had until I got saved. You know what a love is? Is when you pray for your kids and you break and you hurt for them and you pray for them and you try to help them. Listen to me, that's love. Amen. It's not when you throw $20 to let them go buy this and that and you give them everything they want. That's not love. Love is, is when you show them compassion and love and you, and you pray for them and you help them and you try to get them through the problems in life. I know a lot of times my girls don't because I got girls. And boys, you know how boys are. They, you know, they're ashamed to even say anything. But I'm telling you right now, you better teach them. You better teach them, you know why? Because they're going to raise up a generation too, just like them. I look around this church and I know the people in here that was raised up like I was. And that's the reason why that you argue a lot. That's why marriage is in here where you argue a lot, you fuss and fight a lot, you go through certain things, that's the reason why. It's because you cannot show the love you need to show because you think it's weak. You men in here won't take the lead in your home and show your wife the love you need to show to them because it shows a sign of weakness. You say, well, I'm head of the house. She ought to, she ought to uh, be in subjection to me. I know that's what the Word of God says, but let me ask you something right now. Are you the head of the house and, and leading them in spiritual in, 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 in the spiritual leadership with in love through your home? Are you doing that? No, you're not. You want the wife to tow the rope, but you don't want to tow the rope. You want them to do all their part and be in suggestion and everything and listen to everything you say, but you don't want to win their respect and, and tell them you love them and you appreciate them. You know when I was telling you about when I stop and I get my wife a rose and it's for, you know, not on Valentine's Day. They always expect that or on their birthdays or whatever. But you know what? It's when God tells you to do it. But what about when you just do it because it's in your heart to do it? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm not talking about when God tells you to do something. Listen, if God speaks to you, Chris, and tells you to give me $20, you're going to give me $20? If you know it's God telling you to do it? All right, well, what if you see Shane back there and he's walking down the road and he ain't got a gas in truck and he's walking to the store? Is it going to be natural affection and love in your heart and you stop and give Shane 20 bucks but gas in truck so you don't have to walk? See, that's what God wants to get at. He wants to get us to a place where he don't have to tell us to do everything that we do. He don't want to have to tell us every time we need to get a flower for a wife. He don't want to have to tell us every time we need to tell our boys that we love them. He don't want us to tell us every time that we need to do something as far as showing love for our church family or our family and, and family in general. He wants us to do it naturally because we have a mind of him. You know, if Jesus Christ walked in this earth and in America right now, he'd be called on this. Yeah, he would. They wouldn't have accept half the stuff he said. Why? Because he'd teach us men in here how we ought to love a wife. You say, well, ain't everyone's married. Listen to me, it don't matter. He, he's, got a, he's got a bride and he's called the church. And he knows just exactly how to treat me and you. He said, that's why he likened the, the, the church to a bride. Because that's the way that Christ treats the church, like me and you ought to treat the wives. 
They mean you say, well, you can't hardly treat your wife right. She won't do me right. I don't do this right. Listen to me. How many times have you ever rendered good for evil? How many times have she ever put, put salt in your uh, in your pears or whatever and just to be smart enough to you, but instead of you doing the same thing and throwing her underwear in the trash, you just you do something good. I'm just telling you right now. Did you used to be vindictive? You ain't seen vindictive. <coughs> I'm just telling you one thing right now. My wife cherished a picture that she had of me and her when before we ever got married. And it was on an oil canvas. She made me mad. She left, she didn't come back. She'd gone somewhere. Man, I got mad, I got mad with a minute. And before I, and this I'm telling you, I know. And Satan worked me up to it. And I'm telling you one thing right now, I tore half the house now. And when she come home, there that picture was, she treasured more than anything, laying there with a footprint of it. Tore all the pieces. Huh? What would you do? Throw the garbage, I guess, didn't you? But you know why? Vindictive. I didn't render good for you. I said, did you have a good time, honey? I said, I left the house for you to clean. When she pulled in, I pulled out. And the house was in a mess. Listen to me, you can't do th you can't render evil for evil. You gotta render good for evil. And you and listen, if you if we men in here as spiritual leaders, we're supposed to be spiritual leaders in the home, can't render good for evil or good for other things. And and when they have a bad day and you come in, you got hot dogs, like I said before, and you're looking for a big meal, listen to me, say, I appreciate you fixing them. You understand what I'm saying? You better be the big guy. You better be the big guy. Amen. I know I'm too close. And I know sometimes we maybe we lack things, but this is a serious thing. And I've said it before. I'm telling you one thing right now. You know why churches don't have the love they show out here in the world like they should? It's because people like me and other men in the church, listen to me, even elders of the church, they're hateful, grouchy. They're, they're, people won't come to church with them because Every time you see them, you need to get in church. Well, I know that, Dad. You just well. Every time I ask you, you come up with some excuse. Now, how's people gonna come to church and you act in that way? How are they gonna come to church and you tell them that they're not? Until you learn how to love them and how to talk to them, they're never gonna do anything. But you know what? There's people that'll go to their grave being a hateful, cantankerous old farce. And you say that? You say, well, you shouldn't use that. That's what my girls give me for our birthday card on here. And it wasn't because I was old and tanks and everything else. But you know what? My daughter wrote me a card for Christmas. And it was some, they've been a lot of strain in our, in, in our relationship. She wrote me a card for Christmas, brought tears to my eyes. Because I realized one thing. I've grown in some areas. And I've, I've been more patient. With, with people than I have in the past, but I still don't have the patience I need. But you know what? You have to build people's, you, ha you have to gain people's trust in you. And you can't do it for tearing down every time you see them. I'm just telling you. I hope and pray that you realize these little things in our life we think is no big deal are the ones that will get us in the end. Amen. Appreciate all of you. Anybody in here got words before you dismiss the prayer? Anybody at all? Appreciate all of you coming this morning. You need to pray for Bill Mackey. You need to pray for Brother David up there. And uh, it's just going to be a process of time there. But God knows all things. He knows what he's doing. I don't. In church, we need to be, I know we got love in this church, and I know that a lot of people say that. But you know what? Do not compare yourself to the church down the road. Don't compare yourself to the guy sitting the view side of you. You need to compare yourself to the Word of God. That's what I got to do.